All right. Um, good evening, everyone, and uh, welcome to uh, this edition of our Better Business, Better Society seminar series, both uh, here in Otaniemi and uh, online, of course, as well. Um, I am Timo Korkemäki, the Dean of Aalto University School of Business, and I have a pleasure of welcoming you uh, this evening. Um, as we've had um, a habit here, I'll go quickly through some of the recent news uh, at, at our school, and then our, I, list, uh, I, I let our uh, start of the evening take over the program, as we say. Um, so, a few things going on. Uh, first, uh, I may have mentioned to you uh, earlier, um, we obviously, uh, as School of Business, we are accredited by all three leading international accreditation agencies that accredit business schools, uh, and uh, we're in a quite rare group of triple crown uh, accredited schools. One of these uh, three were just with us uh, at the end of January, where ASCSB did their review on us. That happens once every five years. If you're lucky enough to get re-accredited, they will be back in another five years. And uh, we just, um, week before last, we got a final word from them that we are re-accredited for five years. And uh, with flying colors, I might add, we got a lot of praise in their report. I picked a few mo uh, pointers here pretty much straight out of the report on what they thought of us. First, uh, there were uh, comments on the very high level of research that our faculty conducts. And uh, secondly, um, our support administrative staff ha had given a very positive view to the peer review team during their visit, which was virtual, by the way. Uh, back in January, but but and that was worthy of uh, extra comment, and I fully agree with them. We really have super good support staff at the school. Um, thirdly, they commented us on our very strong connection with the industry and and the society in general in Finland, and that's also I must say. I mean, these are. Uh, foreign business school deans that come to evaluate us. They have a few days to kind of get a good picture of us. And I must say, I concur with them on this one too. So, so they really appreciated the fact that we're, we have a very strong connection with the business life and society in general in Finland. Um, so we're good for another five years on ASCSB. Um, second piece of news. Um, we have a new member on our International Advisory Board. Uh, Sanna suvanto Harse is joining uh, our board. We very much look forward to her inputs. Uh, the point on this advisory board is to provide us kind of uh, international feedback on how we can get better. And uh, this is a group of five people. And, um, uh, some of them are in academic positions in leading business schools, and some of them are business people. Sanna is a little bit of both because she teaches at CBS in Copenhagen, but she's also very active on the industry. And uh, we look forward to her input, like I said. Uh, thirdly, I just got to know actually this morning, uh, there is uh, or there was an opening for, for students who are fleeing Ukraine uh, to, to get an opportunity to continue their studies um, at Alta. And, uh, and uh, we, uh, at School of Business, we had received 17 applications and they, are, they have all been approved. So, so we will have uh, a group of Ukrainian students joining us. I, I, I look forward to welcoming them as well. Um, on the right column there, I just threw in a couple of uh, uh, examples of uh, news coverage on our faculty recently. And as you can see, it's pretty small print, I, I'm afraid. Uh, our faculty obviously continuously contributes with their research on on the um, debate in the society. And these two pieces happen to be on the effects of the war uh, in Ukraine that's ongoing. So, so it's just a couple of examples. And uh, we are also, I may have mentioned this before, uh, we, we use kind of an intermediary to get more more exposure in international media as well. So not only uh, Kauppalehti and Helsingin Sanomat as in this picture, but our faculty is fairly 
uh, regularly uh, also featured in international media such as Forbes, Economist, etc. And uh, we're doing that also to push ourselves a little bit further on the on the world map. Now I better quit so I, I uh, leave time for Gautam as well. So so I'll welcome Gautam Paso. He's at our Department of Information and Service Management and, uh, and uh, he can take it away. So welcome Gautam. Thank you, Timo. Thank you. Derve Tuloa Kaiki, welcome. As Timo mentioned, uh, my name is Gautam Basu. I'm a professor of practice uh, in the logistics department, and I'm honored to be here with you today, today to present at the Better Business, Better Society event. And the topic of my presentation is navigating a volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous VUCA, for short, world, with operations leadership. We hope to cover some timely topics with a central team tonight, which I hope you will find relevant and interesting. And we also plan to have a Q&A, question and answer, after this presentation. So, before we jump into the presentation, I thought it would be uh, good to start with a story of an outstanding operations leader. Uh, does anyone in the audience recognize the pictures there on the right, either of the famous ship or the crew of men on the right-hand side? Well, before I tell you who that is, uh, I thought I would uh, show you or read for you a short job posting. So, men wanted for a hazardous journey, small wages, bitter cold, long months of complete darkness, constant danger, safe return doubtful, honor and recognition in the event of success. Uh, this was the original job posting that I applied for uh, when I applied for the professor of practice position here at Alto. <laughs> No, just kidding. Um, this was the original uh, job posting from a legendary operations leader, uh, Ernest Shackleton, in 1914. Uh, this was for an expedition uh, to cross Antarctica from coast to coast uh, via the South Pole. And only 10 people actually had ever stood at the South Pole, and five of those had died on the way back. Uh, you can tell that the posting was only for men because women are too smart to embark on such a ridiculous journey. Um, during their three-year expedition, Shackleton and his 28-person crew encountered tremendous volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and adversity. In the form of a sunken ship, and thousands of miles away from civilization without any means of communication to the outside world, battling hunger, sick sickness, frostbite, and other physical and mental health issues in a harsh, unforgiving operating environment. They managed to get back to civilization through operational thinking, resilient teamwork, and outstanding operational leadership skills of Ernest Shackleton, who the crew called boss. What is interesting from an operations leadership perspective is that Shackleton displayed both depth and skills in Arctic exploration, survival, and logistic skills. With his broad communication, persuasion, and conflict resolution skills that make him an extraordinary operations leader. So, transitioning to today's present day, we are also living in an increasingly volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous or VUCA world. Global pandemics, geopolitical conflict, inflationary pressure, energy transition, climate change, cyber risk, trade disruption, technology uncertainty, and labor shortages have all contributed to this VUCA phenomenon. 
As a result, organizations have had to respond to global demand and supply imbalances, business continuity, and personal safety challenges. We know that operations lie at the heart of most businesses. Operations leadership is essential in addressing the supply and demand disruptions, adaptation, resilience, and operational excellence components of business organizations. In this talk, we explore the critical role of operations leadership in navigating in an increasingly VUCA world. While in a number of ways, COVID-19 pandemic can correctly be regarded as a once in a lifetime event. But it is just the latest incident within recent times to cause a major supply or demand disruption. Other disruptors within the last dozen years include the global financial crisis of 2009, the Japan earthquake and nuclear disaster in 2011, the hurricane and floods in Houston, Texas in 2019, 2017, which I was there on the ground, and the US-China trade conflict that escalated in 2018. It's often tempting to think that these disruptions are rare events, such as black swans, which are characterized by their extreme rarity, their severe impact, and the widespread insistence they were obvious in hindsight. Standard tools of probability and prediction, such as normal distribution, do not apply, since they are depend on a large population and a past sample size that are never available for rare events by definition. In reality, disruptions happen much more frequently and can be classified across a taxonomy of operational risks, categories along a continuum of known unknown, unknown unknown, and controllable and uncontrollable dimensions. These include demand and supply uncertainty, so questions like what happens if sales orders drop by 30% in a quarter, supply uncertainty, what happens if your tier three supplier goes bankrupt, and can't deliver a key component in a subassembly. Operational uncertainty, what happens if there's a fire in your production facility? Think of the Nokia, famous Nokia case, Albuquerque, New Mexico, Phillips, Phillips Semiconductor. Technology uncertainty, what, what if the technology you have developed for your product or your service becomes obsolete due to a new disruptive technology that's coming in the market? Then we have economic and geopolitical uncertainty. If there's a huge risk of defaults for lending institutions by small businesses, combined with an even more income inequality that creates protests, riots, and leads to a political coup or a regime change, um, labor uncertainty, we're facing the great resignation uh, and also, what happens if there's a massive displacement in the workforce due to automation, AI, that leads to high levels of unemployment? Tax, legal uncertainty. What if the average tax rate goes up by 75%? Personal income tax for all of us. And last but not least, hazard uncertainty. What if a new, more fatal pandemic happens, five times more deadly than COVID-19? and it's spread globally. Uh, this is not just gloom and doom talk. Some of these risks actually have become material, right? But, you know, if we looked and talked about these things 10, 15 years ago, uh, yeah, they would say, oh, this is science fiction. This is uh, uh, just pure fiction, you know? So the world has changed. And, uh, you know, maybe not all black swan events, but nonetheless, uh, some have become material, and we have to keep on top of that. I remember uh, doing research in supply chain risk in the, let's say, mid-2000s, and it was not a very hot topic. 
Now it seems like supply chains in the media, uh, even among politicians, business folks, uh, CEOs, C-suite, they're being talked about every week, every day even. So uh, this is an interesting change that I've witnessed. One concept that is now uh, quite interesting is the concept of resilience, and specifically operational resilience. If we think about resilience uh, among operations management scholars and practitioners, it has definitely gained prominence in the last decade. And simply put, operational resilience is defined as the ability to recover from a disruption back to a normal or an improved state. Resilient strategies include policies that increase redundancy in a supply chain, such as investments in operational buffers. So if you think of the last 10, 15, 20 years, we thought, talked a lot about just-in-time efficiency. Now we talk about just-in-case, right? So buffering inventory all over the uh, operational footprint. We've also talked about footprint diversification and supply options instead of having a single supplier or a dual supplier now we're talking about tertiary suppliers if one supply goes down then where is the next and decisions that enhance operational flexibility to mitigate the risk such as robust distribution product standardization modular and concurrent engineering, and the strengthening of supply chain partner networks. We also have this enabler activities. And enabler activities of operational resilience are generally understood to be best practices in supply chain management when the objectives on levels of uncertainty are those of normal times. While the fourth cluster is directly preparing for environments that make resilience the focus. So we are moving towards that fourth cluster. In addition to this, you have operational resilience practices. This includes end-to-end -end supply chain mapping, critical path analysis, operational risk registers, Real options thinking, so we've taken things from finance and applied them to operations and supply chain. Supply chain visibility, applications to make the supply chain more transparent. So based on this, we can see that uh, many of the strategies, the tactics, uh, we are starting to now implement in organizations around the world because of the volatility. So one can argue that uh, there is now more resilient supply chains. And we've also learned from the previous uh, encounters of floods, hazards, uh, supply, demand uncertainties, whereby we've now had a learning curve. So we know what to do. And so, when we think about a operations leadership now, which is the central theme of this uh, talk, uh, there was a recent study based on a working group of operations leaders. And it focused around two fundamental questions. How have our roles changed? And how are organizations responding to these unprecedented challenges we are facing. And you can see that there's a process of stabilization where you assess the damage, uh, you control, and you move towards the stabilization in a new context. Then you rebalance and recover, running into a new normal, normalizing changed context. Then you adapt, you leverage lessons learned from, from the uh, disruption event and you become more resilient and you grow and then you fortify and you repeat where you enhance readiness to navigate the next uh, cycle of the adaptation it's a recover 
and adapt, adapt and recover cycle, continuous cycle. And so essentially the operational leaders uh, have also thought about some of the lessons that have been gleaned from these disruptions. And three themes came out. Number one, the readiness and capability to navigate cycles, ad adaptation and recovery. Number two, the control, coordinated actions to build true operational resilience, which we just talked about. And number three, the reframing of the strategic role and development of operations leaders. We will focus on the latter because this is something around operations leaders, leadership. And if you look at the, the graphic on the right-hand side, uh, there is this whole focus around redefining and reorienting uh, talent requirements and processes for operational leaders. They need to be redefined and a reorientation in terms of operations leadership. That is why this is a very timely discussion. And we here at Alto uh, are preparing and educating the next generation of business leaders to think in these types of contexts because the new normal or the next new normal will happen. So we have to prepare. And so here we talk about reorienting talented processes, the assessment, the development, the hiring, the planning for the new normal, and also re redefining the talent requirements, i.e. the leader of the future and thought diversity. That will be the focus. So the first thing is around operational thinking. Now, if you think about logistics, logistics as a discipline, the origins of logistics have their roots in the military. And as such, I've done some research in this area from an operations leadership perspective to see if there are some insights we could glean from the military. If you think about it, theaters of warfare tend to be very volatile, uncertain, complex environments to operate in. And there is a military uh, concept called operational thinking. And this comes from the German word, operatives, denken. And this is the ability to think broadly and focus on the big picture. While concurrently or at the same time, being able to be fluid, in the moment and course correcting the actions and adapt quickly as the battle materialize in the moment. And this requires assessing facts, assessing the data that's coming in, perhaps on a real-time basis, linking disparate events, connecting the dots, deducing patterns, making quick decisions, and being able to separate what's important with what's trivial, non-important. And cutting through the mists of uncertainty and complexity. Essentially, Operational thinking requires both broad and deep capabilities. And I think we can learn from this. And you see here, this is a, a picture of General Patton. And uh, there's a quote by Patton there, uh, US World War II general. And uh, it talks about being spontaneous in action, having a bias towards action but also having this broad thinking, never losing sight of the big picture, right? And all the way back to Napoleon in 1812, he says that an operational leader must have the ability to build an operational picture, 
of a situation in a theater. This means an uncanny ability to know and understand all military and non-military aspects of the situation in that theater. You reduce the complexity of the situation to their essentials by properly differentiating between important and trivial elements, link disparate events, deduce patterns, and envisage future trends in the situation. So what this means is connecting the broad with the depth of skill that is required to operate in this volatile, complex, uncertain, and adverse world. And we can see that in the current, these are quite old quotes, as you can see. You know, if we look at the situ current geopolitical situation, uh, the first part of the uh, Ukraine conflict, the reason why the Russians did not do well is because of logistics. They could not get their supply of tanks, ammunition, gas to the field. This has happened time and time again in history. Can we learn from history? I think we can. Another thing bringing it back is T-shaped profiles. Um, and this is very related to operations thinking or operational thinking. I first heard of the T-shaped profile when I was working for a small company called IBM almost 20 years ago. And I've used this model for the recruitment and vetting and hiring of teams that I've led and built over the years. And to explain this, one can think about the different types of professionals. If you've worked in your organizations, there are different types of professionals. There are I-shaped professionals, T-shaped professionals, H-shaped professionals, pie-shaped professionals, dash-shaped professionals, right? And the shape of the professional is used to describe whether he or she is a deep specialist in one area. This is considered the I-shaped professional. Deep specialist in two areas, this is the pie-shaped professional or the H-shaped professional. Deep in one, just one area, but with good knowledge, skills, experience, and complex communication abilities across many other areas. This is the T-shaped professional, right? T-shaped professional. And this one, the dash-shaped professional is more of a generalist. This is one who has not deep, but good breadth, so broad skills. This is more the generalist. Now, companies like IBM and operations, people like Ernest Shackleton, they are T-shaped professionals. T-shaped operations leaders. They are very good and deep in one area. In Shackleton's case, he was Arctic uh, survival and navigation. But he had very good communication skills, very good listening skills, very good empathy, leadership skills, right? But he was deep in one area. And so this is something that we can learn from when we think about operations leadership. Right? Um, skilled T-shaped professionals apply their depth of skills and experience to a rich scope of situation and challenges and implement their cross-organizational insight to fill competency gaps. Knowledge resulting from exploration is categorized as novel, uncertain, complex and ambiguous is synergistic with T-shaped skills. Um, and T-shaped skills, they apply their depth and skills to a rich scope of situations and challenges. And they're able to work cross-functionally and cross-organizationally. Um, 
and they're used to, they, they do very well in new situations. There's quite a bit of research in uh, innovation as well, innovation management and the T-shaped profile. So they share some common characteristics. They're also open to continuous learning and training. They gather technical skills for the job at hand and constantly develop an evolving skill set. You can see from our discipline with the T-shaped skills here, there's something from the supply chain or operations. So on the horizontal, you see both hard skills that are broad and soft skills that are also broad, right, from a uh, humanistic perspective, but also business competency. But at the end, they have very good one very, very deep skill that they are good at. And in this class, it's uh, around supply chain. So there are many different types of uh, T-shaped thing. You, there's one I've seen from the medical field as well. Uh, and these tend to be in the leadership positions because they are able to relate to uh, others and have very good listening and communication skills. So these are very good operations uh, leaders of the future. And I think as uh, getting ready to navigate in this new normal or the next new normal, because we will adapt. We will, we will adapt, we will re we recover. There will be another disruption and event that will happen. If you think about it, uh, you know, we are just getting two and a half years dealing with COVID, right? And now people are starting to come back to the university. I'm just teaching a course right now. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's adjusting, recovering, adapting. But then what happens? Now there's this geopolitical conflict and we're seeing now uh, massive uh, demand and supply imbalances. If they weren't bad before, now they're even worse, right? Oil is uh, hitting, uh, I didn't look at it today, but it went up to $130 per barrel. I think it's hovering around 100 now. Uh, so inflation is here. Right? If you look at metals, food prices, just go to the grocery store. I have my app, right? You know, use, so I, I look, it's 20 to 30 percent more than it was a year ago. So this has all affected us. We have to adapt. And so the thing is that. Yeah, the folks that adapt the best and what we as a university should teach people to be adaptable, to be comfortable in uncertain, complex, ambiguous environments. Because, uh, yeah, that's life. It's uh, dynamic. It's always changing. Um, and so we should not be uh, afraid. We should uh, basically uh, address these. And, and be resilient ourselves, build resilient teams, resilient organizations, build resilient societies. So this was basically uh, around the leadership component of operations and helping to navigate this, this, this VUCA world. Now, I want to open it up for some questions, but before we do, I just want to let you know that here at Alto University, we have launched this podcast around the topic of operations leadership, which aims to provide insights for today's business leaders on creating value through operations improvement, process excellence, digital innovation, and surprise, operations leadership. <laughs> so uh, this is available on Apple and Spotify platforms. So uh, I welcome you to listen to it and provide feedback. And those of you that want to be guests, I'm always looking for guests on the podcast. I'm the host. So uh, if you're interested in uh, being a guest, please let me know. Come talk to me and happy to, uh, to host you. So... Um, I want to thank you uh, for, for your 
attention. And now I open it up to uh, questions from the uh, physical audience. I know we have some uh, members from the uh, online community, so uh, please answer, uh, ask away. Yes. Thank you. Okay, everyone here. Here's uh, what are some key characteristics of companies that are our best performers in a VUCA world? Hmm. That's a good question. Yeah, I mean, I would say that you know if you look at the clock speed of change, so companies that are typically in fast uh, consumer goods, they tend to adapt quite quickly. They're quite agile. And, you know, the performance attributes of being very responsive, agile, adaptable, uh, and aligning with demand and supply and matching demand and supply are, 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 are pretty good. And those are, I would say, also quite resilient as well because they capture the demand signal quite well. And, uh, yeah, I, I would say those are, uh, would be best in class. And the other thing is that We've had so many of these disruptions, we mentioned a couple, uh, that we're starting to build a learning curve and risk registers. Uh, so now there, there's talk of building a, a function around this, a supply chain risk function, uh, and having readiness drills, stress testing. Um, you know, before 20 years ago, if you ask somebody how, if you map your supply chain, they can only go one or two tiers on the supply side and one and two tiers on the customer side uh, downstream. So now, uh, because of all of this, uh, you're able to map end to end. Uh, there's now more visibility applications there. There's also very complex and sophisticated uh, risk uh, algorithms that you can run. Uh, and you know we're adopting uh, a lot of the uh, cross-discipline or cross-functional. So taking elements from financial uh, function and being into uh, implement that in an operation. I think I mentioned real options theory. So now they have uh, implemented that in, in, in supply chain and operations management. So uh, companies that are best in class uh, will, will be ready for this. Now, there are some things that, that, that are very difficult. I know, for example, automotive, uh, you know, consumer electronics. Consumer electronics is it has been very responsive in the past. But what's happened then is that there's a, a complete bottleneck. If you look at companies like Sony, like Microsoft, uh, you know, it's, a, it's a, a year lead time just to get their consoles because they can't get the critical components. It's, it's, they're, you know, so they're stuck as well. So I think every company is, is suffering a little bit. Some are doing better than others. But you know, I, I would say the best in class ones are the ones that are proactive. It's again going into this operational thinking where you're thinking very broadly, but you're also focused on uh, adapting uh, and being very fluid in the moment, course correcting operationally. Other questions? Hi. Hi, thank you for a great lecture. Um, I wanted to hear your thoughts on the construction industry or um, let's say another project-based industry. Mm -hmm. um, uh, any reflections on that? Because what I'm experiencing working in, in the construction industry actually is that we lack basically systems thinking mm -hmm. um, and essentially we don't acknowledge the necessity of supply chain management mm. um, in our business today. And especially in the world we're living in that you well described, I see this as the main challenge we're facing. Right. Yeah. Um, I would imagine that construction industry is a, it's a very project-based industry. So you're, you're essentially building custom projects. So from a supply chain perspective, maybe it's not as important, but I can tell you this, that now the lead time for materials, uh, steel, uh, cement, uh, the raw materials for cement, it's getting harder and harder. Um, and so there, 
you know, it goes again to the just in case as opposed to just in time, right? It's switching to just in case. And so uh, it's hit everything. And on top of that, your raw materials and your components have gone up astronomically. I mean, if you look, I, I, I didn't look lately, but the cost of aluminum, cost of steel, they've gone up four, five, six X. Uh, so how are you going to be able to uh, contain those costs? Um, are you going to use uh, sophisticated hedging instruments to basically for the sourcing and the procurement of those materials? So, yeah, I would say that uh, in that industry, because it's a project based industry, you, you need to manage your, your supply chain, even though it's project based. And, and also, I would say in that industry, it's, it's highly cyclical. So getting that uh, all the flow of goods, materials there, um, you're going to need to uh, get a grip on that much more uh, carefully and, and control. Yeah, I mean, there was the one slide I showed about uh, controllable and uncontrollable. You know now that there's inflationary pressures that are going to be happening. And that's going to directly impact your industry among many other industries. But I would say in your industry, um, it's a matter of, yeah, do you basically now start to procure and source, uh, look for secondary, tertiary uh, suppliers for those uh, components, those raw materials that you need at a project site. Okay. Other questions? So online. Usually when, uh, when I'm in the class, if nobody's asking questions, I usually pick somebody <laughs> to ask questions. <laughs> and I've been so used to uh, teaching in the Finnish, uh, Finnish uh, lecture halls that uh, people are quite shy, so they don't want to ask questions. So This is starting to feel like when I was back in <laughs> school, because I was yeah. always the one asking the questions. Yeah, no, please go ahead. Um, I have another one. Um, yeah. It was really interesting, the part about the T-shaped um, mm -hmm. talents. Yeah. So just thinking about building my team. So right. um, how do I recognize it early on in the, let's say, young potential? What are, what are early signs of T-shaped talent? Yeah, it's a great question. And, and it's something that I've actually implemented myself. And I look for T-shaped profiles. So uh, y if you look at, let's say, let's start from the scratch. You're hiring from... Right. So somebody could be, let's say, a uh, logistics or marketing or finance specialist who's really deep. He or she is really deep in that area, uh, but then also has uh, has interest in psychology, uh, music, uh, sport, uh, very broad on the horizontal aspect. But also the uh, uh, human skills. Do they listen well? Are they empathetic? Can they relate to people? So I think those people are the people that I look for. Um, how do you develop that? I think it starts, well, from parents, first of all, and then from the school. Can we encourage that in our thing? There was, uh, you know, uh, during IBM times, there was this discipline called service science management engineering. And actually, Jim Sporer, who was uh, director of Almedin uh, Research, he came to the old Kappa Korkiakolu, and he gave a speech on SSME. So they talked at length about this T-shaped profile. And I consider my, myself a T-shaped profile. I am very deep in the kind of logistics and operations domain. But as I went, you know, in my 30-year-plus uh, career, I got interested in, you know, finance and M&A and psychology and music and this and that and so maybe I'm not so uh, deep in those but uh, I'm interested I have a curiosity about that and and uh, I'm would like to you know speak with others to learn from others because t-shaped profiles are very open to learn you know we have this concept of lifelong learning or life-wide learning so you can see if somebody's eager uh, you know, otherwise they're this I-shaped profile where they're very good at one thing and I, I don't want to do anything else. Did I answer your question? Yes, great. I think this gentleman had a, had a question up here.
Yes, thank you. About 10 years ago, we had this book on black swans. Yep. Or even a bit more than 10 years ago. Yes. And uh, since that, we all been sort of waiting for or been a bit afraid of black yep. swans. Yeah. And now we have seen some mm -hmm. really, really black ones. Yep. Like the COVID one. Yep. And now what we have the Ukrainian war. Yep. Which is kind of extended to the feeling between NATO and 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 Russia, mm -hmm. the Western world and and the Eastern world. Right. Then. If we look at the financial market at the moment, mm -hmm. for so long we have had this period of negative interest rates, yep. which we have never seen before right. to that extent, even for a shorter period. Mm -hmm. But for, for so long we have the, uh, this incredible supply of money in by the central banks yep. in the in the in the market. Do you see big black swarms coming out of that as a result of of that? Yeah. It, you know, I think that, you know, you mentioned this this book came out about ten years ago. Mm. And you know, by its by its nature, black swans are de defined by um, very low probability, high impact. Uh, it, I think there was a guy by the name of Donald Rumsfeld. He was way back in uh, George W. Bush uh, when 9-11. He said, the unknown unknown, right? Remember that? And so I, I, would, I would say that some are maybe black swans and some are not. So I give you an example. Uh, in 2017, I was in Houston, Texas, during Hurricane Harvey, on the ground. And they would call that the one in 1,000 year flood, a black swan. But if you look at Houston, or you look at New Orleans, they're at sea level. They've had a history of flooding. Uh, so my, 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 my pushback would be that, why weren't they prepared more? Why was there so much uh, damage. So you mentioned about the uh, the current geopolitical conflict that's happening right now. Um, this has happened before as well. And so, uh, you know, I think if you look at history long enough, certain things start to appear. And, uh, you know, if you know uh, this gentleman, uh, Ray Dalio, he's a hedge fund guy, uh, one of the successful guys, he actually predicted a lot what's happening with the financial markets because his time series was way back. And it's, it's, it's quite scary the way his prediction worked because he looked and he saw where debt was. He looked, he looked at multiple factors, uh, you know, income inequality. Uh, even in Finland, which is a very uh, equal society, income in inequality has, has risen quite a lot. Uh, and so he said basically all, he had like seven or eight or nine factors. He said that basically where we are today or last year or two years ago is basically looks like 1927, 1928. Okay, and we all know what happened then. So is it that much different? I mean, I hate to be the gloom and doom, but I, I, I think COVID-19 was a bit of a black swan because that was something that just shut down everything. That, you know, there was the Spanish flu, right? Uh, if you look at some of the pictures, I mean, if you look at the Spanish flu, 19, 1915, 90, people were wearing the masks and everything. Uh, there was a higher death rate, I think, for the Spanish flu. But uh, yeah, I mean, Many of these things have happened in history, you know, and we should learn from history. Uh, you know, and this is, again, part of the, uh, 
this operational thinking and operational leadership principle of being able to think very broadly and looking way back in history, you know, not just 10, 15, uh, 20 years, but even more. There's now these, uh, uh, you know, strategic foresight where you look 10, 15, 20, 30, 40, 50 years. There's a guy by the name of Peter Schwartz who, uh, who used to work for the Royal Dutch Shell Company, uh, very famous uh, scenario planner. And him and Pierre Wack in the, uh, the 70s, uh, or I was in the late 60s, they, they were looking at uh, what is happening. And it was like a story, like narratives, these scenarios. And based on that skunk works group at Royal Dutch Shell, they accurately predicted, uh, you know, the 73 uh, uh, OPEC crisis, the fall of the Berlin Wall, uh, and subsequent Soviet Union, uh, multiple things, which were, you know, you'd think that, wow, how, how can, you know, if somebody doesn't have a crystal ball, you're, you're basically using, I mean, again, if you look at the word leadership, leadership is an art. And one thing I didn't mention here is that operations leadership, it's both management and leadership. So it's art management. If you look at Frederick Taylor, scientific management, uh, you know, these type of more scientific quantification type of principles. But leadership is an art as well, more than a science, you know, leading you know, so it's a combination of both, just like the T-shaped profile where you have to think broadly, but also very deeply as well. So you need both. Yes, sir. Okay, what would you say, what would your advice to be? Because so many of these various uh, difficult times that we have had in, before in like in 1930s uh, mm -hmm. and then and thereafter. Yep. They've been, the background has been a sordid, so very bad shortage of something. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Or there's been a war or something like that. Yeah. What is your advice now to the uh, leaders of the central banks of the, of the two decades of close to zero yeah. interest rates? It's not shortage, so... Uh, yeah. Now people are worried about shortage of energy. Yeah. Uh, or, or various other things like we were basic metals. Yeah. Or micro uh, micro processor. Yeah. Processors. Yeah. But in a way, the back one is is in in the uh, this abundance of yeah. of money. Yeah. And and nobody seems to have a view on from the background from previous experience mm. what to do with that yeah and what to do with the very low interest rates no inflation except now yeah we have seen some some yeah. signs but there's uncertainty about what to do with that right whether to cut the supply of money right and what to manage this this sort of oversupply yeah of of money yeah no it's a it's a great uh great point um i'm not a banker but but i have heard through my friends in the u.s that they they are now uh doing the opposite so inflation is there inflation is here as well and the way they typically report uh inflation it's chain weighted so they're stripping out the uh, the the energy cost as well as the kind of food cost, uh, as as a, as a, as a as a as a part, and so um, again, I I I I have a feeling. Again, I don't have a crystal ball, but they're going to have to to tighten the, the 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 money supply. I don't know. Maybe Ami knows more, uh, but I I don't think you're you know they they will. Uh, you can't continue that, and I think the U.S. Uh, they've already started to take uh, steps towards that. So yeah, now we, I mean, it's another economic cycle that we're going to go through. Yeah. Yes. 
not, not necessarily. Well, a part answer, but then a question also, a follow-up question to that. Uh, Ray Dalio actually is a good one to, to uh, look to on it for an answer on this one. He talks about a beautiful deleveraging, uh, which could take place if the central banks know what to do. And he, he'll talk about different elements that need to be in place for that to happen. But uh, it's this balance of, of uh, raising interest rates and, and uh, still feeding money into the system um, in a way that doesn't cause a crisis like, like we saw in the, in the 30s. And uh, we, can, we can hope that that's not repeated. Uh, a follow-up question, somewhat on that line of, of thinking, not so much on the central banks, but uh, um, if we had looked at the world, or as we looked at the world two and a half years ago, um, everyone was, I think, kind of thinking along the lines of, uh, this is steady going, things are great, we've had decades of peace, uh, let's be lean and mean. Right. Uh, and that was, the, that was the thinking. And if one, had been, if one had asked someone at that point to extrapolate, that's what their, their forecast would have looked like. Mm -hmm. Now if we f try to extrapolate and forecast from this point on, the, the thinking has again shifted right. very, in a very, to the end of the other spectrum, right. or the other end of the spectrum. Right. But that's probably not right either. No, exactly. Um, where yeah. do you think, and no one knows the answer to this yeah. question, but where yeah. do you think the right point lies? Yeah, I mean, again, I think you answered it. It's nobody really knows, but uh, you know, for me, uh, you know, I've done work in supply chain risk management for, yeah, uh, a, a while, basically. I mean, this this whole discipline came out, you know, after the September 11th attacks, and they were talking about things like, you know, black swan events, like another uh, a terrorist attack on, uh, you know, and. People were like, whoa, 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 you know, th this happens. This really is a black swan. That doesn't happen every day. But production fires, uh, logistical delivery, uh, these everyday operational glitches, they happen every day, right? Uh, but we have, to, we have to basically try to be rational and not go from one continuum to the other, right? In the sense that, yeah, it's not all gloom and doom. But it's not a rosy picture either. Uh, we have to be pragmatic. I think uh, here in Finland, uh, you're quite pragmatic. Uh, and so, uh, yeah, just be pragmatic. And as the, we get more information, more data, uh, you know, we can be fluid in our decision making uh, and, and course correct if necessary. I think that's one of the things in operations leadership. As new information, new data gets put on the uh, ground as we learn more, then we can course correct and adjust and adapt uh, and be fluid without taking the big picture, the broad picture out of our mind. Always keeping that in mind, the objectives that we all have, but also be flexible. One of the things on resilience is operational flexibility. How flexible is your supply chain design? Can you uh, have the upside flex in your production? Can you have the downside flex in a bad time? So flexibility as well. So I don't know if I answered your question, Ami, but appreciate it. Any other questions? None from online. OK. Okay, thanks. Uh, actually, previously, before the COVID or uh, today's situation, let's say the world, let's say economic tr trend is more like the globalization. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, especially for the supply chain manufacturing. Yeah. How do you say, based on, with this kind of black swans has come quite often, mm -hmm. is it the globalization is still coming as a mega trend or localization will be take over? <laughs> Yeah, it's it's you know I, <laughs> I uh, I won't mention any names, but there was here maybe five years ago there was this the, we have the international business, and there was a professor there that was this was five six years ago, and uh, I, they were talking about globalization, and we here in Finland it's you know it's a small country, and so you're born global, right? There's the that's been here, and globalization is very big, and. But in the back of my mind, I, I asked the question, actually, there I said, what happens if there is deglobalization? Right? Deglobalization meaning 
more movement back towards the consumption point. Okay, so this is moving back manufacturing to Europe, to the US. We've all seen it, made in Finland, grown in Finland. You go to the supermarket, oh, I'll buy that because it's made in Finland. It's the same thing in the US. So that, that has been happening for at least five years. Okay, uh, it will further accelerate. Uh, and that will basically um, dis-elongate the supply chain uh, because the lead times uh, from the order to the actual delivery to the consumption point, that will, that will basically be shorter. Um, and you're also seeing, for example, with this, uh, uh, the semiconductor industry, now I think Intel announced some sort of uh, billion dollar uh, semiconductor uh, uh, facility. Uh, I don't know where in the U.S., but you know that that has been a real result now because uh, you cannot just uh, have some form of labor arbitrage, but then have the major risk of something not being uh, delivered. And so there, the trade-off between globalization and risk, uh, people are seeing that. Uh, and you put the soup of the geopolitics and and economy, so yeah, I think globalization at least it, it's not it's not a you know I'm a big fan of globalization. I like globalization. I'm global profile myself, but I think people are that's kind of gone out of favor in a lot of circles. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so in that case, uh, actually, uh, now we have talking about a lot of the inflations. Mm -hmm. CPI is increasing all the yep. time. Yep. And uh, of course, the raw material is increasing, and mm -hmm. logistic cost, uh, shipment cost is yep. increasing. Yep. Uh, labor cost is increasing. Yep. Uh, increasing. And uh, how do you say the influence of this kind of deglobalization mm -hmm. will influence, how much it will influence for this kind of inflation? Yeah. Because globalization or centralized manufacturing makes a lower cost yeah. on the volume uh, volume production. Yeah. But do you think that this kind of deglobalization will really, really hardly in increase this kind of inflation rate? Yeah, of course. It, it, you know, look, if you, if you produce something in Finland or the U.S., it's going to increase the cost. But what, what are you, what are you, what are you uh, trading off? You're tr trading off the risk or the cost. You know where the product is coming from. Now we also have the sustainability as well. Uh, people don't like to have this, uh, the, the carbon footprint. They want to have this, uh, the triple bottom line. Uh, they don't want to have child labor. They don't want to have conflict minerals. So now they're looking at this. So those dimensions are now also seriously looking at the, the, the buying uh, con uh, consumer patterns. But 100%, the cost will go up. That, that's inevitable. That's just simple economics. So, yeah, you can expect that. Great, so I'm just looking at the time. I want to thank all of you for your questions and your uh, attention. It was a real uh, privilege and honor for me to speak. And uh, yeah, thanks, thanks so much. <laughs>